thousands of feet of pipe irrigation. I've done irrigation pipe, maybe farm style three inch pipes to my backyard stuff. So I know irrigation. We're going over micro irrigation today, drip systems specifically, okay? So you, you folks from California, you love your flood irrigation. <coughs> Older parts of Phoenix and Scottsdale, you look to flood everything. We're not talking that, we don't do that anymore. Water's too expensive to, to water that way. That's old school, okay? Drip irrigation literally pays for itself in the first 12 to 18 months, just in reduction of water use, okay? So that, that's, we're going over that specific, we'll go over all the details, okay? From flowers, shrubs, to vegetables, to trees, we'll cover all that, okay? Um, then I wanna go over the parts, how to actually put it together. Some of you inherited a landscape that already has drip in, in, in it already. We'll show you how to modify and how to change and tweak and do all that. You can add to that very easy, okay? Super easy, especially after this, you'll, you'll be a pro. So you'll be brave enough to try it, okay? Uh, and then I thought I'd go over some plants and, and what kinds of irrigation. I grouped them by irrigation types. We'll just discuss why this, why should we water this this many times a week as opposed to these times, okay? So that's, that's my whole plan today. We'll do that in about 45 minutes or less. Depends on how many questions you all have. Then we'll, we'll answer, at the end we'll answer a lot, of, a lot of questions. We'll make this interactive, okay? You, uh, you nurses, accountants, engineers, you're gonna be in heaven. The detailed mathematical <coughs> folks, oh, you're gonna love this. <laughs> folks are more artistic, uh, feeling maybe, we'll try to hone in, we'll save a lot of questions, get you all going, but I think we'll simplify this enough where we're all in the same zone, or at least we can start making mistakes in the right direction, okay? Number one, the biggest mistake I find, people misuse, they don't know how to use drip irrigation. I notice my Californians really have a hard time with this. They're watering every day for 10 minutes. That's an absolute blunder with drip irrigation. Mainly because drip irrigation has basically three different flows. You've got a half gallon per hour emitter, you've got a one gallon per hour emitter, or you've got a two gallon per hour emitter. There are some funky ones that adjust and play that can go up to about 10 <coughs> gallons per, per hour. But the point being, you've got to run this drip system for an hour to get one gallon of water on it. That's not very much water. So we'll, we'll, come, in, we'll come back to questions in a moment. So this plant, this is a two gallon plant. This is a two gallon artichoke. On average, if you're planting this, this is going to be approximately, it's going to need about two gallons of water per week, okay? So if you've got a one gallon per hour emitter head on there, how long do you need to run the one gallon per hour emitter head uh, per week? About two hours, okay? Okay, so the way you can compensate for that is maybe I put two emitters on there, so I double up, so say a tree. This is a five gallon pomegranate. Yes, it will actually fruit, get pomegranates. Uh, five gallon pomegranate needs about five gallons of water per week. So if you've got one gallon per hour emitter head, how long do you need to let it run? Five hours. Okay, so there you might actually put two, or maybe you're using two gallon per hour emitter heads to get the water count up, up higher. Now, I'll tell you what my favorites are, my favorite emitter in a moment. But I'm just trying to get a point. You need to not water every day. You want to water a lot push that water all the way through the root zone and then a little bit further if you can and that's going to create a very deep rooted uh, plant. The big mistake I find is people are watering a butterfly bush or a fruit tree every day very lightly and so you've got, you, you've killed off all the deep roots. All we have are very shallow roots. When the monsoons come in July and August, the plants literally blow over. Mark my word. I see it every year. Every year I see it because they were watering frequently and not very deep. So when drought comes or when wind comes or storms, the plants are so shallow they blow over or they become stressed. You don't have enough root zone to, to, to keep, them, keep them going. So we're gonna, I'm going to teach you how to water deeper and longer so we get a deeper root mass so those plants are much hardier. They'll take on any kind of, of winter we have, any kind of heat in summer, any kind of wind storm, uh, they'll, they'll be able to handle that. Okay. Uh, a 15 gallon tree, guess how many gallons of water it needs about a week? 15. About 15. A 10 gallon tree, about 10. 
It's real easy math. You can just, that's how I simplify it in my own head. It's, uh, the math is a little bit off on that, but basically for, for us, one gallon plants in one gallon, five gallon plants in five gallons, 15 plants in 15 gallons. That's a real easy way to quickly figure out how many emitters do I need and how do I need to set my clock. Otherwise, it's mystifying. You just don't know, you don't know where to start. It's too confusing. <coughs> um, okay. For while we're on water, just how often should I water? For established plants, fruit trees, trees and shrubs and vines, bigger rooted things, okay? If they've been in the ground for about two seasons, it takes about, <coughs> let's pick this uh, blackberry. This is a new baby cakes blackberry. It's a dwarf blackberry. It's a shrub, not a vine bramble thing. It doesn't take over. Um, cute little thing, but it takes about two seasons for it to get the roots from this out to the surrounding soil, so I've got a big root mass. Uh, same with a native. A lot of folks go, I'm gonna plant a agave or a, or a yucca. You still need to water the thing. I know it's a native, it can go by itself eventually, but it's dependent on you to get those roots, encourage them to grow out into the surrounding soil. Once it gets out there, it can go on its own. But you need to encourage it. I see that as a big mistake. They plant it, water, spit on it, walk away, go on that cruise to the Panama Canal, come back and it's dead. They wonder, what happened? You didn't water it enough. It couldn't, it didn't, it was so, the roots were all in that one bucket. You need to get it out. So it takes a couple seasons, okay? Uh, for this plant, I would water it twice a week. <clears throat> Most of your trees, shrubs, vines, things with big roots, if it's a brand new plant, I'd water it twice a week. Deep soak. If it's established, once it's full on by itself, then I would cut that back to once a week for established plants, okay? One deep watering a week. This is track, some of you are going, I'm not tracking. I'm watering every day right now, or every other day. Or the landscaper, who basically, you know the landscaper. Maintenance guys, they couldn't get a job, but they had a pickup truck and a shovel, okay? That's, that's how they got that job. They aren't the sharpest tool in the box. They're just, they're not, some of them are blithering idiots, okay? So just be aware, you might be smarter than your maintenance gardener guy. It's very, very possible. Uh, so if they're watering every other day with your drip system, they don't know what they're doing. You might be able to get away with that for tomatoes, flowers, things with real shallow roots, but not trees and shrubs. If we're doing that, we want a deep soak, so we want to water it about probably an hour and a half, two hours at a shot to get that water through the root zone and a little bit farther. The problem with that is some of you are out in those heavy clay areas, the Prescott Valley, basically the Caliche layers, heavy clay starts, 69 corridor. You have high hills, the ranch, and just keeps on going. And it gets worse the farther up the valley you go. So you're, those heavy clays, they'll receive the water, but they don't drain very fast. So you need to actually water deep, and then don't water for a while. So let it dry out in between. Plants need to breathe in between the water cycles. Okay, trust me. Uh, so for, for established plants, once a week, leave it on for a couple hours, that's probably about right. Close. Um, for that's, that's trees and shrubs. Now the flowers are a little different. Vegetable gardens are a little different. But a big honeysuckle vine, that's got roots to go down two feet. Out probably three or four feet. A big fruit tree is gonna have roots to go down about two feet and out probably 10 feet in a circle. So you've got big roots, root masses, okay? So are you track with me? I don't see too much confusion. Seems like we got gotcha. you, okay? Leave. And you know more than your landscape maintenance folks. You, you do. Now, the way that the uh, drip emitters work, here's your soil, here's a tree, okay? And you've got an emitter right here and right here maybe. So as it goes down into the ground, it creates a little teardrop shape. So it looks wet right here at the top of the surface. Might be a wet spot like this then it goes down in a kind of teardrop shape into the soil. So you're getting more water on there than you think you do, if you're deep water, okay? So what you should be doing right now is you should run your system into a tune-up. Your irrigation needs a, a tune-up like a car. 
It's just like a car. If you just let it run, it's been five years, you're expected to keep running, it's not, there's some broken parts there. You need to go through and maintain it. Right now, we're activating our drip systems for April because we're into the growing season. Uh, so go ahead and turn those systems on, run them, and then walk the yard and see where the wet spots are. Look for those physical wet spots. Now, if there's a lot of growth on top or a lot of compost or mulch or a lot of rock, what I'll do is I'll run the system twice. If I do it twice, usually that doubles down the water. Obviously, it doubles down the water. Then it, it, it shows those wet spots. It's easy, easier to spot where those spots are. Okay, so are you tracking with me? So run it twice, just in the same day, and then go look for, do I, are the emitters actually working? Some of the emitters actually came off in the winter, or the gophers ate them, or the javelinas got to them, or whatever happened, and they're just spewing like, like beautiful fountains in the, in the yard. Okay, you need to probably put a clean cut and stick a new emitter in there. But you don't know that until you actually go and, and test it. So whatever you do, don't go on that long RV trip across country and just turn the system on and expect it to go because you're going to have some, some issues. So you need to just check those. Sometimes the water will settle in the, in the unions, in the connections, and those cracked because the water settled, it froze, cracked, and it, it broke those. Very easy to replace, but you don't know it unless you're turning that system on, looking for the wet spots, and generally, I'll be walking the yard while the system is running so I can see I've got some pressure on that on that system so I can see where the weak spots are. So, so do that, it's a simple tune-up, okay? The other one you need, need to do while you're doing that, um, this is a filter, all drip systems. This is actually a full-on manifold that goes on a, on, a, on a hose bib for like containers, patios, decks, that kind of stuff. But right here, all systems should have a filter on them. This is actually frightening. Um, you know, it'll be spooky how much dirt is in your water that we're drinking. Uh, but you need you need to capture all that sediment. And if you haven't cleaned this this spring, now is the time to, to do it while you're turning it on. So look for that. Usually this is going to be in that box in the ground. There'll be a filter on there to, to screen out the sediments on your drip systems. The orifice on these emitters are so small, just one little bit of grit will clog it up. And so you want to make sure you're filtering that. If you're having issues with the emitters blowing off, jumping off, or, or clogging up, usually it's the contractor did not put a filter on it. You need to do that. Or they didn't put a pressure reducing valve on. So it's running at the normal 45, 60 pounds per square inch, regular house pressure, but your toilets and sinks are running with. Your drip systems do not want to work at that pressure. So you'll get these emitters, it's leaking, spewing, it's not as efficient, it'll blow off the heads. So you need, to, you need to reduce that pressure down to 15, 20 pounds per square inch. Okay, so here we sell this particular filter because it has a pressure reducing valve and the filter combined into one. So it's trying to create, it's a little bit more expensive, but it creates a much shorter manifold and just easier to get into boxes. It's just a, it's a, better, it's a better system. So there they combined it. I think this is 30 pounds per square inch plus a filter included. So watch that. If you're running at too high a pressure or you don't have a filter, you're going to have issues eventually. Just, just kind of be aware. Okay? How does that hook on? What's that? I used to be so stupid, but how does that hook on? Oh, your hose faucet coming out of the, of the house? Oh, Screws right on there. So this, I made this for some folks, a lot of folks travel here. This is a travel town. And so they've got all these containers or hanging baskets or tomatoes out there. And so I made this, it screws onto a hose bib right here. It has a battery operated timer. So it just, you can, you can program it to go however long you want. It comes out, reduces the pressure, filters it, and then you connect your half inch tubing. We'll go over that here in a second, over all the parts, how they go together. This made to screw on your hose bib and just put it out there around the front yard. Yeah, price range. I think this is like a hundred bucks. If you include the battery, if this is cheap here. The batteries are the ones that are the expensive piece. This is just a better battery. I don't know. It's one that has helped a lot of gals. I went. I got to help these folks. They're, they don't know how to. This is this is the hardest part. I taped it, glued it, got it all going. So I just glue it on. Half inch tubing goes here, and you just put your drips on. 
Yeah, I bought one of your timers. Yeah, but I don't think we I inherited the thing, the system. So I don't think there's a filter, a pressure regulator in the timer. Can you just get a filter pressure yeah. regulator? Oh, and put oh it good, on the sure. Timer we got. Okay. So he's got a battery. He bought the battery last year or something, timer. but he doesn't have this piece. Can you add it on now? You can add this on super. And these are available in, in the shop just by itself. Just 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 this part. So if you got a timer, you don't need the Yeah. I've got all these parts. Uh, and, and here's what I do, my philosophy. If you go up to the wall of plumbing at Depot or Lowe's, it is befuddling. I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. It's so confusing. Um, and then the box stores, they'll change out parts to save a penny. It's all about, they're going to sell millions of parts off across the country. They can save one penny, they'll do it. And so they've got parts that, are, that don't fit, inconsistencies. And so what I've done, or they'll cut back on the UV stabilization of the plastics and so they don't last in the sun as long. We've gone with parts that are better UV. Um, you could literally run, you could literally run this across the ground with the sun heat it up for 10 years, it would still be good. It's that, it's a better plastic. It's a little bit more expensive, but a way better pipe. We're looking for that. Our drip systems, our drip parts, um, like uh, this is an adjustable zero to 10 uh, drip emitter. Um, this is actually, will last longer. It's self-cleaning. We've picked the parts specifically to make them work better. We're assuming this is the gardener using it not a not a landscaper. Landscapers are all about the contract price. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, you can afford to buy a little bit better plant or part and put it in because all this is this is all labor. <clears throat> Irrigation, the parts themselves are cheap. It's all about muscle, dig trenching across your yard, putting it in. That's what that bid price is. It's all labor. It's not the parts. So why not get a little bit better part for yourself? Anyway, that's our philosophy. That's our everything, not just trip parts. So they'll last better, they'll be better, better in the yard. Okay, let me go back to my, where I actually said, here, I'm going to go over a handout I put together. It's a four page handout. It goes over schematics, how to put things together. I'm gonna to email that to you. It's in a PDF format, it's four pages. Uh, it's too expensive to print, too cumbersome. Uh, it'll be to you by the end of the week. Give me your email. Now, if you're on our regular garden club email, you're not going to, they don't get that. It's just the students here today. Okay, so you got to give me your email for you to get that. Okay. Um, so that'll be available. We're going into detail now on the exact parts. What do I need to do? Uh, and it all starts with, in, in the ground, you've probably got a box with a cover on it. In that box, hopefully, you've got more than one valve. That's usually you'll have a you'll have a pipe coming out. Then you've got wires coming off this way. Then it will come off with your filter. Usually a Y filter. Then it goes off into your hose. And then your, your hose or distribution line goes off from there. That distribution line looks like this half inch tubing. <coughs> so what I did is I brought all my parts from home. And I wish I had a cordless lapel mic. <laughs> <laughs> this is half inch distribution line. Okay. The funny thing about this, there's 50 gardeners here today. Want to learn about irrigation? There's about three or four manufacturers of this of these of this particular size. They're all called half inch, but none of them are actually half inch pipe. This is 0.62 uh, inches to be exact. This is the most common variety. If your contractor, the homeowner, you, you got got it mainly from Depot or Lowe's, they use a 0.58. It's a little bit smaller. Again, they're trying to pinch pennies everywhere they can. They're all about price. And so they, they just simply made the tubing. It looks the same, but the tubing's actually smaller. And so the 0.62 parts won't fit on those. So you gotta make, you gotta see which part you've got, what type of system. There's some that's actually closer to 3 eighths. I mean, uh, a 3 quarter. 
inch. It's a really big one, more commercial size, big long runs, farms, huge properties. You're using a bigger, bigger pipe. Um, so just make sure you check what size pipe you've got. Probably what I would do is I would clip that off and take it to the nursery or the, 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 the hardware store and just check, make sure it fits. Is that the inside okay? or outside? Uh, is it the inside or outside measurement? I believe it's the outside measurement, 0.62, okay? Spaghetti tubing, this is called spaghetti tubing or quarter inch tubing. It goes by two names. This is your distribution, this is how you get from this main pipe here, you'll tap in and go from there. This takes you out to the plant. This gets you close. This actually gets you to the root ball of the plant. Okay, and we'll show you how to how to put that together here in a second. Okay, so out of the box in your yard, you've got a actual valve. This is what the clock actually turns on and off. It's a 12 volt valve. It turns the clock. It turns the water on and off. This wire goes out to wherever your clock is. Usually in the garage outside someplace by the garage, okay? So that clock sends a signal to this and opens up. From there, the water opens. This is at full house pressure right here. This is probably at like 50 pounds per square inch. Goes through your valve, pressure reduces to here. Now it's cutting in half or a third, and now it filters it and then sends it out with that distribution line out through the yard. So the hardest part is getting this, this stuff out through the whole yard. Okay, it's getting it close to the plant. From there, if we know where that distribution line is, then we'll tap it with the spaghetti tubing, or the smaller tubing, and get it out to the plant. How many feet of this half inch tubing can you have in a yard? The book says up to 500 feet. Most yards, that's more than you need for a front yard. For the smaller lots, it could even do the front and backyard all, all on one valve. Um, of 500 feet, and you can have up to 500 emitters. It's almost unlimited how many emitters you can have on one valve, okay? Because it's so efficient. So don't worry about, oh, can I add one more valve? The answer is always, yeah, you can. You certainly can. What you get into is elevation. Some of you are on the hilltops, and so what you'll find is at the top of the hill, So if you're on the hill, it's my yard, classic Prescott yard. They've dug out, they put the basement, it's a two-story house, the garage is right here, okay? This is, this is a classic mountain lot. Pretty views, it actually screws up. The hydraulics get kind of funky. The math on the pressure gets kind of funky. So at the bottom of the hill, the pressure is probably double what at the top of the hill it is. So these flowers, have less pressure or less water coming out than at the bottom of the hill because you know as water goes downhill pressure builds so you have more psi at the bottom okay this is the reason that i like to use pressure compensated emitter heads that's when you want to write down pressure compensated uh, so many uh, landscapers use a flag emitter it's got a it's got an emitter with a little flag on it it's usually green blue or black it's very common. The reason they use that one is because it's cheap. That's why. They'll, they'll spend, you know, 30 cents on this instead of 50 cents on a better one. It's all about price. If you're going to use a thousand emitter heads to help a client, you're after pennies. What you want to use is a pressure compensated emitter. And I brought an example of that someplace up here. Here we go. This is a pressure compensated button. This is called a button emitter as well. So this will actually keep the rating, no matter the elevation, uh, at the bottom of the, where my thing go? So if, you, if you're using these consistently throughout the entire yard, this particular emitter head will be more true to its rating at the bottom of the hill, it'll be the same as at the top of the hill. It, change, it actually compensates for that pressure, so it forces the same amount of water to come out of that tip, uh, no matter where you are. This played out even in my yard. The first house I ever had was in Prescott Valley. And those are pretty flat lots. But there was a slight grade kind of going away from the house. That much grade will actually change the pressure. You would notice, uh, if you're not using this type of emitter, you would notice the flow would be far greater at the bottom of the hill than at the top of the hill. 
Okay, so we're into, we're into hydraulics and engineering. Uh, engineers are loving this. ESI, oh, this is great. Uh, but, but water is very heavy and it's hard to move around. So you want to you want to realize that when you're when you're watering your plants, okay? So use a button emitter. So I only sell one emitter here at the garden center, one, and this is it. I've got different kinds of flows. I've got half inch, a half gallon, one gallon, and two gallon. But I only have one. They're all pressure compensated because when I'm helping clients, I want them to be right on the money. Can't make a mistake. If I'm helping you, Ken's out there helping. You can't make a mistake. So that's that's emitter head. We also have one of these. A lot of folks like to use this is an adjustable emitter head. It's got a, it clicks, can can adjust the flow. Um, I don't care for this emitter myself. I've got none of these in my own system. Because what happens is if you put a lot of these out in your yard, what'll happen is you'll start changing the pressure in the entire line. And so when you adjust this one, open this one up. This one stops flowing, and it's just impossible. It's like playing with Jello or something. So I don't. I like to be very consistent, so that every emitter comes out exactly the same same rate. This could be okay if you've only got. If you want to add some emitter, some water flow, to let's say a tree that was so small now it's bigger, and you up the up the up the water amount. That's where these get used. Because uh, so, now you can snip off the one and put this one on and open it up and have more flow. I would rather see you clip it off and put a T in there and put the same, put a pressure compensated emitter on and have multiples, two or three of those, rather than one of these and just open it up because it's difficult to, to get the exact pressure. Okay? You want to be consistent. What I do like, what I do use a lot of, So here's my spaghetti tubing. Comes off here, connects onto this, and then it's that same emitter. It's adjustable, so you can actually open it out or close it, but it's got a stake on it. I use this one on all of my containers, because now I can put a spaghetti tubing on, I can, I can put it in the middle of the flower bed, and now I can adjust it, and it creates a little bell shape, so I can adjust it to the size of my container. And usually it's one, one of these per container is enough. I water trees, shrubs, whatever size pot, little tiny hanging baskets. I don't manually water anything in my yard. Computers, God allowed man to create computers to run irrigation, I'm telling you. So why, why, some of you love to water. Your hobby is not actually gardening. Your hobby is watering. And so I don't like to do that. I want computers to run this. And so I've got two computers, two control valves, one in the back, one in the front, and they have multiple valves. So I've got up to five valves in the front because I'm watering containers on one valve. I've got my time lawn on a separate valve, the soaker tubing. I'll show you what that is in a second. I've got my trees and shrubs on the right side of the driveway on one valve. And on the left side, all the roses on the on the left side of the driveway are all on their separate valves. So I've got, I'm trying to create zones for different kinds of plants. Some of you are handed a curse. You're trying to, to water trees and flowers and shrubs and vines all on with one valve. That is impossible. <clears throat> Can't be done. You're either over watering your trees while trying to keep your flowers and tomatoes and stuff happy, or you're underwatering the flowers and trees, and you're just trying to make your, your trees and shrubs happy because they need once a week watering, right? A tomato in June needs watering probably every day, or at least every other day or so. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. If you're going to put another valve in, or, or if you're going to add to your system, why you got that trench open? Throw three or four lines in there. Take the spaghetti tubing, what I do, I've got all five, I've got five of these things running through my trench. And then what I do is I take spray paint and I color code them so that I can tell which one was the flower one. I go all the way back to the valve, I'll actually spray paint the valve that same color, red, blue, yellow, orange, whatever is in the garage and a spray can form. That's good enough. So now I can, when I want to add to that, when I want to add a drip emitter, 
I can open that up and I see five lines there because I've got five valves because I've got it's going all over the yard. I can now tell which one I want to tap into. So it makes sense. A simple trick to, to really identify, simplifies maintaining that drip system down the road. And that's just what I do. That school of hard knocks, I put in too many of these systems where I go, dang it, which one was that again? But I spray painted it, it was super easy. Okay. Uh, again, if you're doing bid work, you're having your contractor bid a drip system, he's going to try to talk you into less valves because he only knows how to sell you on price. You don't want that. You want to tell him, I want three valves and a clock that will run all three because I want to water my trees and shrubs on one, my flower pots on another, and for my vegetable garden over there, I only do seasonally, I want a separate valve just for that. You want to tell him what you want, then he can bid on that. Otherwise, it's just going to go, ah, it's 1500 bucks. You put one valve in, and then you're, you're coming in going, Ken, how do I deal with this? And going, it's impossible. You can't make trees and flowers. Short, deep-rooted stuff and short-rooted stuff happy. Okay? So, in that box, we're going back to that now, you'll probably have, when you open up that box lid, you probably see several of these. Hopefully, you see several of these. But they're all right, that clock is running, has separate wires. Here's your wires coming off. Got positive, negative, 12 volts. Uh, you could actually open up the box. If your clock actually goes out, battery's bad, lightning strikes, you can actually open this box up. And they'll usually be a little cock valve. Usually, varies. Usually it's got a little uh, key like this. You can actually open that up and manually turn it on. Sometimes it's the actual, where the wires are coming off, some valves actually you turn that solenoid, it will open it up manually. Depends on which valve they were using, whether it's Orbit or Rainbird, there's different makers for these. They're all basically the same, 12 volts on and off. You could actually manually water them as well without your clock, okay? Let's explain the clock, and then we'll go into the actual parts. We'll put some parts together for the trip systems. The clock. This is a mystifying thing. How should I, how do I program my clock? Let me try to simplify that whole system for you. So that you'd be brave enough to go actually open up the lid and decide how to program, how to explain this. Okay, so some of you really like, it's got a, most clocks have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they name every day. They go, when do you want to water it? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I want to water it Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Or whenever it is. Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturdays. Most clocks, I mean virtually every clock has got a skip day feature. What I would do is go past the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then it will go to, you want to water odd, only odd days, only even days. And just past that, it will say skip days. Focus on that. That's what we want to look at. Because really, once you decide how long you need to water, I'm going to water for two hours once a week. Once you figure that out, you water two hours every time you water. I don't care whether it's January, November, June in the heat. You're watering the same amount. It takes this much water to water the entire root zone. Once you figure that piece out, that's an equation you never have to think about again. Now all we have to think about is, I need to water two hours, how often should I water? That's the real variable you're playing with. In the winter, you need to water about every 14 days for trees and shrubs. In the growing season right now, you're watering probably once a week. Okay, so I'm gonna water two hours once a week that's easier to program than trying to figure out now when, which Mondays do I turn on, which... Now you go to skip days and go skip 14 days in winter. Or in the growing season, skip seven days. Or I just bumped up my time lawn from seven, I think I had it at every 10 days. My time, lawns are a little bit different. I don't have grass. I've got creeping thyme. And so I don't have to mow it as often. I mow it twice a year, that's it. It's pretty much evergreen, it's trail hardy. I just bump it for every 10 days to six days, because I'm trying to wake it up, get it to fill in and grow. Um, 
So all I did was open it up. I know I never changed how long it runs. It always runs the same same length. I'm just changing that one variable. How many days do I need to skip between the next water? And so when we get into June, once we get up to about 90 degrees, probably in June sometime, I'll probably bump that up to every four or five days for my time on the lawn. Okay? My flower pots, I just move from every seven days to every four days. Because they are in full bloom. And when things are in bloom, they take more water. So otherwise, it will get dry, it will just shed all that foliage, shed all the beauty, the flowers, and just focus on keeping it alive. I want to keep the flowers, or flower growing. And so I just bumped it from seven days, because it's been cold. Now we're in the growing season now at every four days. And then I'll bump that, I'll monitor it uh, as the flowers are talking to me. I'll, I'll change it and change it accordingly, okay? Um, pansies, they're beautiful right now. I use pansies in my own yard for my flowers, kind of the canary in the coal mine. I use that as a leading indicator because pansies, they're crybabies. They whine about everything. If they're cold, they lay down, I'm cold. If they're dry, they lay down, they're really talkative. In your yard, you've got some plants that are more talkative than others. It's not gonna be the spruce trees, it's not gonna be the pines, they're just rigid, green, blue, whatever. But some plants, that new growth will be responsive to dryness. Keep an eye on that. You watch that one, and now you can tell when do I need to change my clock. When do I need to give it up and go from every six days to every five days, every four days. So there's certain plants. Use that as a, as a key. Uh, sometimes I'll plant a pansy just so that I can monitor the water. Uh, rather than a, than a, it's pretty, it's prettier than a moisture meter. Some of you actually are not in tune with your plants as much. Uh, get a moisture meter. It's super easy. It's made to tell you when it's dry, when it's wet. Or you can use a half inch uh, uh, screwdriver or a piece of rebar or something, something about that thick. If you can get that in the ground, it's moist. Once it won't go in the ground anymore, it's dry and crusty. Time to water. So there's different tricks that you can use to figure out when do I need to water? If in doubt, leave it out. That's a philosophy you should have with watering. Especially if you're in the Prescott Valley, uh, Prescott Country Club, even Chino. Those valley areas, very heavy soils. They don't perk very well. So it receives water and then it doesn't give it up very easy. So there you're more, much more prone to overwater, kill things by overwater than by underwater. And what will happen? The, the, the uh, stress indicator of your plants, the leaves will start to dry. They'll start to curl. They'll, they'll get brown tips on the leaves. The flowers will wilt and then drop. Those are all indications of overwatering. But it sounds just like underwatering. And here's why. When the plant's got a full root, let's say you're taking this. this this beautiful peony. First of all, peony, they're draw hardy. They're very tough. They would rather be dry than wet, okay? They love to grow. Mine grows in my raised beds <coughs> by itself. I hardly care for it. It blooms every year. Super easy. It has a very fleshy root zone. Same with rhubarb. Uh, there's some, some of these plants have very fleshy, uh, very, a lot of sugars in, in the flesh. Uh, the roots can be divided and split that way, but they're also very prone to rotting if they do that. So what happens is, if I overwater this plant, the roots will actually start to rot off. And so you get less roots. So you had a root like this, but it got too wet. So all of a sudden the roots are rotting. It has less roots, less roots, less roots. And so the indication looks like it's not getting enough water because it's not. Even though it's surrounded by water, it's not getting water because the roots literally rotted. Root rot is what we call it. So when you dig that plant out, going now, why? What happened here? What's going on? You actually smell an odor. You can have, it smells like sewer, or rotting smell. That's root rot. Also, the roots will be streaked. They should be a beautiful paper white. When you take the root and scrape the bark off. It should be bright white, like paper. If it's brown or streaked or anything besides white, that's root rot. Only one thing causes that. So look for that. So that's more prone 
especially in the month of June, it's hot and dry, and we think, oh, it looks stressed. I give it even more water. So if that's the case, before you start laying on more water, get a moisture meter. Do that screwdriver check, check or the rebar thing. See how much water's in there. Or dig a hole. See if there's moisture in that hole. Sometimes, I just helped a gentleman a couple days ago, his plants died because he's watering through winter like twice a week. He went, ooh, that's a lot. Uh, he was up at the base of Mingus, one of those new beautiful homes, uh, and he just was overwatering. In the winter, they were using moisture, but not very much. And so when he dug those plants out, literally the hole was filled with water. And literally, he had a bathtub effect. And so he had some caliche layers. There's a layer of basically cement going through the soil that doesn't perk, it doesn't drain. If we're going to come out and plant for you in those areas, we'll try to take the jackhammer out. We'll try to fracture that. We'll take a portion of the hole, take the bit, and try to <laughs> fracture that so the water will drain through to the next soil band. If we never make that fracture, if we don't we call it digging a chimney, if we don't make that chimney, uh, the water just pools and, and fills up. Well, can't, can't I change that by just fill, putting rocks in the bottom? If I fill up your bathtub with water and I put rocks in the bottom of it, does it help the drainage? <laughs> Does we have to actually get to the next soil band. If you look at a cut on the roads, you'll see the different layers of, of soil. We're just trying to get to that next, wherever that band is, we're trying to get to that. All of a sudden the magic happens, things start root rooting, and it goes. If you don't, you'll tend to get root rot. The plant will just shed its, its buds. This thing's loaded, look at that thing. This is a, this is a Ito peony. They've actually grafted an English peony, which is the common regular peony your grandparents grew. We grafted one of those onto a tree peony, bigger root mass. So now we get a bush that's like this big. It's like it's on steroids. It is, it's on a bigger root. Uh, and it puts on flowers this big, not this big. And they're fragrant, like nothing else. They're more fragrant than an English. So they're more expensive because they are exotic. But we, we sell the gardeners. We get the regular English ones. They're fairly inexpensive. This runs like 70 bucks. But if you're, if you're a collector, a true gardener, you collect this stuff. And this color, this is a yellow. You can't find yellow in English. They just don't make it. But if we're, we're hybridizing, we're creating new life. <laughs> uh, they're actually creating new colors and stuff. Uh, this is how they, that's how they do it. They're grafting things on each other with funky new styles. I've got one of these. It looks about like that in my yard. It looks just like that. It's in a big pot by the front door. I've got snapdragons have been, been uh, uh, growing in that all winter. This thing just woke up with the, with the weather. It's now erupting through the uh, snapdragons. And, and now it'll bloom like this. We'll greet every person that comes, comes home, comes to visit our house, or mainly visits me. It just greets me going, Ken, I'm so happy you're here this morning. Let me fill up the entire front courtyard with peony fragrance. It's like, makes my heart giddy. I just love that. That's why I'm a flower grower. Uh, so anyway, that's, I plant that in a, in a container, and I use one of, that one with a stake on it. Where'd that go? There we go, right there. I use this to water my peony in a, in a pot. It's in a big pot. It's been in there for years. And so I just put that on there, and I put it out to the, to, to the right belt, uh, shape of the pot. Okay, what else? Questions? Been okay? Usually there's disbelief at this point, going, no, you gotta water every day. That's kind of a unique thing. I bought a house, black gate garden, it's renovated. It's got a drip system, most of them seem to work, but I thought you just screwed the thing on and toss it, maybe put the timer in between. I don't know anything about that. I haven't seen it in the garage, I haven't seen it in the ground. Gotcha. Where the hell is that? I mean, gotcha, okay, so. He's asking, he's got a, he's got, he's taken over a garden. Who did not have one? Now, he's saying he doesn't see this box in the ground. How big is it? It doesn't have to be, usually it's about two feet by a foot and a half. It can be green or tan, sometimes black, usually green or tan. And it'll be in the ground, it'll be at soil level. Sometimes soil actually kicks over top of those and you can't find them, they're hard to find. Uh, sometimes you can hear them running, so if you run your system, you hear this high-pitched, uh, high-pitched water sound. 
sometimes I've found them that way, and you kind of dick, kick the soil around and go, oh, there's a box lid, oh, you open it up and there it is. Uh, sometimes, my, like my house in Prescott Valley, I had a crawl space underneath the house. Oh, I'm not going to put that in. I'll put that underneath the house and pop it out the side of the uh, stub wall uh, and go that way. So it was underneath the house because I could do that. Uh, most of them were in the ground. Yeah, because the hook, the, the drip line in the garden goes underground for a little bit, comes out, and had a hose attachment. Put it on the spigot, it was running for a while, and okay. it blew off. I imagine you have know, pressure regulator, right? Correct, yeah. So for you, your gardens, I don't think they ever used this. That wouldn't shock That I think what they did is they just had the drip system, the, the parts we'll get to in a yeah. second. They just attached a hose yeah. off the off the hose bib, attached to the to the system. At the very least, get one of these and attempt, go back and attach it to the hose bit so the clock can run it for you. Then you're not a slave to turning the, turning the system on. I mean, I am notorious for forgetting. Turn it on, it's running for two hours. I go off to church or I go visit friends or I'm going to lunch and it's been running for a day and a half because I forgot to turn it off. So the clocks make a big difference. They also make this clock, I brought this one, where is it at? Here. They make this. This is actually a spring loaded. Let's see if you can hear it. No, you can't. It's, it sounds like a clock. Actually, you turn it on, you screw it on the hose. This is on the hose bed. Your, your drip system or hose or whatever goes on to here. Then you turn it on by just clicking, I want 90 minutes. And now it will just run for 90 minutes and automatically turn off for you in 90 minutes. At least do this. I would say don't do it by hand because you will forget and your water your water bill will be high. That one. Okay, so don't, that's a good way to go too. What's that? This is only a clock. It does not have a filter. But if you wanted to water this way, I can help you set up a filter system. It's pretty easy to, to do. You could set up a filter and then have your half inch go back. I, I bought your clock, so I just need the filter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the reason it was blowing off is because the pressure is too high. It's blowing heard. off. Just sitting there all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. yeah. So let's go over this stuff. Okay, well, let me pull up my. All of you should have. This is what I use. This is mine. It looks cheesy. It's just an old bathroom, whatever. I think I stole it from my wife. She's probably wondering where all of her bathroom chemicals are. I took it, honey. It's my drip part box now. This sits in the garage. Because you're going to need some maintenance, you're going to have some parts. And so I just have this, I've got a miscellaneous thing, I've got to go digging for it. Um, but, if you need one of these, okay, this is a pipe cutter. So many folks will use a pair of scissors, that kind of stuff, but if you're going to have a drip system, have a good tool. You just put it on there, clip it, it just cuts it off real easy. And you don't mind getting it dirty. And the main thing is, it's brightly colored. I used, these used to come in just contractor black, and I would spray paint them red or something. Now they're actually coming in colors, because you'll set this thing down, you're like, where is, where is that thing? And you lose track of it. Orange, you get this fine easier. Just if you're doing a system, this is, just trust me, it's cool hard knocks. Uh, you all need one of these. This is a hole punch. Oh, mine's rusted, oh my gosh. Uh, I think I need a new one. This will be my new one. It's not going back in the box. Um, the reason I sell this hole punch, some folks will use nails. Some folks will use, you need to punch a hole into that main distribution line, and it punches a little hole out. The reason I like this one specific, the reason I chose this one for our customers, my friends, is because I got a little arthritis everywhere anymore. This one goes in the palm of my hands where I can get it into, I can make the hole punch easier. It doesn't wear my hands out. And it physically takes a little piece of tubing out. <coughs> Whereas some of them just poke a hole. And so this makes it easier to poke the quarter inch line into the tubing. Again, I'm after ease. I'm trying to curate easier to use parts for my customers. So when we've got it, when you go down to the drip part section, it's only four feet wide by as high as us, four by six. It's been simplified because I'm not trying to sell 
I'm not trying to sell everything to everyone. I'm just trying to sell the better parts to my friends. This is what I this would this is what I would sell my own mother. So why wouldn't I sell it to, to you all? So it's a, you know it's 50 cents more, but it's way better, and it's red. Because when you put emitters in, you're pump, hooking all up, going to the next thing, you're going, now where is that punch? I can find it. So many of the contractors have this little flag thing. It's tiny. You can't hardly see the thing. They just said, that. Ah, forget that. I'm not selling those cheesy parts. I'm going for the bigger one. It's better. So you need one of these. Every, everyone, if you have a drip system, you should have this. From here, now that I have a hole, I'm not going to try digging through my parts. Or should I? Here. <coughs> I will generally go with my spaghetti tubing. This stuff, where's the end? There it is. Generally, I try to put this on first because I've got two free hands. Some folks will actually put this quarter inch coupler into the tubing first and then try to get this onto the coupler. I like to put this on first because now I got a handle. Just, just, there's no right or wrong way. This is how I do it. Uh, and now I'll take this and that hole that I punched, I'll just poke it right in, it goes right in. Okay, there's no glue, there's no tape, that's all there is. Poke a hole, throw it in. Because it's under low pressure, you're not gonna have leaking. So it's got a it's got a flange, it's got a flare to it that, that kind of captures, it keeps it from getting pushed out, and as the pressure goes in, it actually pushes it out against the tube and keeps it from leaking, okay? Same with these parts. So this is a coupler. It brings two pieces of half-inch tubing together. I chose this one, I think this is put together by Rainbird, because this part covers the half-inch, the 0 .58, 0 .62, and the bigger one. It goes, covers multiple, covers a multitude of sins. Uh, it'll, do the, it'll do the normal one like this, but it will also do the, the uh, depot cheaper stuff. So bring any kind of pipe and it will seal them together. And I used to just carry the 0.62 because it was a better size. I was having customers to be customers had their system put in the home before by a, a depot system and it just didn't, the, the parts weren't interchangeable. Now I can buy a coupler, put it right on there. Hold on. It takes two hands. And once it goes on there, once it goes on there, you can't get that off. I you got to be Superman. You better eat your Wheaties to get that off. It just goes right on. And so now you put your other piece in there. This comes like in a coupler. It comes in a T. And it comes in an elbow. There is a slight bend to this, but if you bend it too much, it will kink. So there you want to use an elbow. Okay, so you can get a bend to it. But as soon as you got to go around a corner, use an elbow. Because this stuff kinks too easy. Just buy the $1.99 part, put it in there. It just, it'll save you a lot of headache. Okay? Same with the uh, half inch or the uh, quarter inch tube. Where are you at? Right here. No? Okay. Anyway, trust me. These also, the quarter inch, the tight spaghetti tubing, also comes in coupler comes in a T and it comes in an elbow. So you've got those three basic parts. And every system needs some of these. This is called a goof plug. And I'm sure there's a more technical name, but we landscapers call this a goof plug. I poked a hole into the, uh, into the line and I went, oops. So then I can go, oh, pull, pull in the wrong place. I can poke that and just plugs it up. It's just a plug is all it is. <laughs> so you need some of these. No system's complete without some of these because you're going to make a mistake. <laughs> or one will blow out. You need to plug the hole. Something I, That plant no longer needs emitters. Uh, so you, you need some of these. What I'll do with some of my Russian sage, some of my natives, agaves, yuccas, I'll water them for one year until I get them rooted and then I cut them off with the irrigation. I'll actually put them on the drip system, and then I'll just take, I'll cut off the emitter, plug it, or I'll bend it back and tape it off. I keep the line there, because as a gardener, I think it might need me someday. I've never put an emitter back on it, thinking these natives 
need water after they're established. But just in case, I feel better. But I'll, I'll, I'll use this kind of thing. Also, at the very end of the run, into the line, uh, try not to, to bury that because you'll want to flush your lines out every once in a while. Even with the filter on, that white stuff that builds up in your toilet and then uh, in the sinks, it also builds up in the lines. Um, and so I like to flush that out. So yes, I flushed my filter out, cleaned it at the beginning, but at the very end of the line, stuff gets in the line. I don't know where. And so this is called a, uh, take this. I'm gonna cut this piece off. So what this does is you slip it in, there's a figure eight, you bend it over, and then it just keeps it kinked. Super easy. So very inexpensive. So there I would just take this, open it up, run the valve, flush the stuff out, turn it back. So many times I find, the mistake I find is at the very end, they don't want to see the end, they bury it, and now it's harder to maintain. Just, I always leave these sticking up someplace behind the plant, just so I can find it easier. Because it's been, again, school of hard knocks. I just had too many times where I'm trying to find the end of this, I couldn't find it. I also try to keep my emitters. Um, let's say I'm gonna use this uh, half gallon button emitter. Let me cut this off. So this is that pressure compensating, uh, pressure compensating emitter. Um, it just barbed. I try to leave these sticking up out of the plant in a sweet spot. I like it to be above the soil, but I like it to be below the pruning cuts because I'm notorious for shaving these right off when I prune. <laughs> or I, my grasses, I mow them with like on my lawnmower. <laughs> Done. I'm out of here. Shortcut kick, remember. Um, so I try to put it just below where I might be tempted to cut this thing off with shears or something. But I want to be able to see it so I can watch it running. So I know when it actually clogs up. What happens is earwigs, pill bugs, and the rolling bully deals, they'll lay eggs inside this and they just clog it up. Or gophers will, will eat on it, bunnies will chew on it, javelina. So it'll just, if, if I can leave it exposed, I can see it running easier. Some contractors like to bury it because they don't want to see the hardware. I want to see the hardware in my yard so I can maintain it easier. It's just pure, makes gardening easier. Just trust me, it'll, it'll be better for you, okay? Also, drip emitters for myself, this is my personal opinion, I sell all three varieties. I personally like a two gallon per hour emitter head. And here is why, plus maintenance. So this particular emitter, uh, we chose this one because it's, it's affordable. The water goes in, it spins around, so it cleans it out, and it's then actually controls the pressure, then drips. Looks like it just drip, 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 drip. Um, so it's self-cleaning. But I like the two gallon per hour emitter heads more than a half gallon or a one gallon, because the orifice is just a little bit larger. And I find I don't have to replace them as often. Just go hard knocks. There's no right or wrong. If your contractor puts them in, more than likely, almost guaranteed he's using a one gallon per hour emitter head, because that's a standard. You don't give your laborers who are not, they couldn't get a job anywhere else. They're, they're doing drip parts. Um, you just don't have them think. Just here, put this one on every time. I'll tell you how many you need. And so they'll, they'll do it that way. If we're coming out to plant for you, uh, we would actually tie into this half inch drip part We'd go back, try to find this, tap into it, and then take it out to that new plant. Um, what we would do is take a one, one spaghetti tubing, and so our folks actually know what they're doing. And so they'll take this one, they'll probably, if it's a bigger tree, put a T on it, and then put an emitter over here and emitter on this side. So that if one fails, we still have water going to that plant. Survivability. Our folks aren't just planters, they're plant people. So they're trying to get the health of the plant actually honed in for that plant. Uh, landscapers, generally your gardener, they're probably just putting one emitter right there. And so if you get a clog up, um, you'll have an issue. Some of you, your landscape's about three or four years old. It's time to expand the system. 
this is a big mistake I find. Two things. One, the tree went, was tiny and cute. Now it's got some size. It's got some, some uh, uh, trunk size to it. Um, it's time to get it off of that one emitter. You probably need to maintain or tune up your irrigation. And so there you need to clip that, that one off, put a T on it, maybe put two, two emitters or maybe three if it's a bigger plant. So you need to expand the emitter heads. Also, you need to get away from the trunk. So if I'm the tree and the emitter was right here because that's where the roots were, but now my roots are out under the drip line, I need to move the emitters from the trunk out, out to the, further out in the drip line. And the drip line would be, let's say this is a branch, I would go halfway from the trunk to the outer tips. I'd go halfway out, put my drip emitters out there because that's where the feeder roots are. <laughs> the roots that actually take in nutrients and water. As the tree grows, the uh, roots at the base of the tree, right at the trunk, those are just support roots. They're big, barky, thick, large roots. They actually take no water in at all. They're only there to keep the tree upright. The feeder roots are the fine hair, like, like, uh, like hair roots. They're further out. So you need to put the water out there. That's where you're also focusing on the, the, the food is out there, the drip line, okay? Second, as you're maintaining that, uh, the drip system, if your trees are still on stakes and they've been in for two, three, four, five, seven years, they still have stakes on them, pull the stakes for the love of gardening, please. <laughs> pull the stakes, it's time. If the tree can hold itself up, you don't need the stakes anymore. I'm going through neighborhoods that are well established, it's, and you probably won't be able to, they probably either rot it off some, some of the stakes, like my neighbors, around the corner, not to be named, the trees are holding the stakes up because the stakes <laughs> rotted off. They just haven't had a bold kiss cut. If you just don't know, clip the wire that that's the tree's holding to the stakes. Don't pull the stake out because that's a hard part to get in. Just cut it and see as it leaves out, how does it handle the wind? If it stays up after the first windstorm, and it was off the stakes, pull the, break the stake off. So you can always retie it if it needs to be back on the stake for another year. Most trees only need to be on a stake for about two years. And then it can be off, even the smallest of trees. If you're buying a deep over lows or a whip or smaller, smaller tree, if there's certain ages where they're just thinner, um, there they might need to be on a little bit longer. But even a big apple tree, for our, all of our trees are five to seven years old. They're of fruiting age. And so those trees only need our trees, trees from us, Water's Garden Center, folks on Space Building, Water's Garden Center, uh, two years most, really probably just one year for a bigger 15, 20 gallon size tree. Okay. Questions? I don't see too much glazer. I don't see drooling and uh, I don't get it anymore. It's, it's like, like you all are in the zone. You got this. I think you're doing well in the back. I got five um, tree trees that are on one adjustable emitter and I'm expanding it. Great. And I've been using the, the kind of emitter, drip emitter, like this cereal. That is not the one the end. Is there any Good. problem with those? Okay, so he had an adjustable emitter for his fruit trees. He's got five fruit trees, Let's see if I get this right. And you had one emitter, you're not expanding that, which is good, perfect. And you're going to use the soaker hose effect. Just the, the regular water emitters. Oh, they go in line, in line emitters. Got it. Perfectly fine. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. That's actually a good way to go. Um, we do have this, it's called soaker hose, where they've actually put an emitter in the line every foot. There's two types. There's every six inch spacing or one foot spacing. My personal experience is one foot spacing is what you want. Six foot, six in, inches, let me go back to inches. Six inch spacing is too, too wet. And you can't get a long enough length to it. Um, I like the one foot spacing. So every, every foot, this is a quarter inch tubing and you'll see there's a little little swell right there and a, and a little hole. So they've got this rated for one gallon per hour and every foot on this 100 foot line is an emitter. This is tremendous for strawberries, uh, ground covers, uh, creeping thyme. This is how I water my creeping thyme lawn. 
I buried this just underneath the ground. And so then I planted the lawn on top of this. So this, this slowly seeps. It deep soaks by creeping time. I noticed that uh, uh, vegetable gardens, it's a great way to go. You snake it through a raised bed and then just pin it to the ground and it will water, water that plant. But yet, it's easy enough to pull up so you can rototill that area and lay it back down. It's a great way to go. You can get about 25 feet of this per rock, per quarter inch, tie it into your half inch line. Uh, you go about 25 feet. Then you need to have another line. Okay. So does it make sense? Yes. Yeah, of course not. Like my, the old inherited garden that all the emitters are too old want to be replaced. Yeah. But since it's, it's like two strips that are like 100 square feet each, should I go that route? Could you so go with this? Garden, yeah. yeah, that would be. This would be a great way to go. So he's got two big raised beds, basically. Two raised he, beds. He's got uh, old, older. He's, he's inherited these gardens. 20. I'm wondering if he could pull up the emitters that need to be replaced anyway and just put one of this and exactly. snake it through. This would be a very good solution for that. And I find this works far better than spray systems. They make a micro mist or spray system. Um, I've stopped using that altogether in my own gardens because it's not as efficient. You're using drip system for efficiency, for, lack, for reducing water use. This is the closer you get to the ground the more efficient it is, because you don't have evaporation. As soon as you pop up above the ground and mist, you're getting more evaporation. You're losing a percentage, a large percentage, of the water because it's evaporated. Go this route much better. Yeah, and it just goes right into the half inch to get yep. the other spaghetti. Yeah, you just take yeah. your quarter inch. If I pour my box out, yeah, quarter inch, you just go with this. Quarter inch coupler. Again, put it into the tube first. Poke your hole into your half inch line, push it right in there, and at the very end you'll need a plug. Usually you're using the goof plug to create the pressure to come out the two or the, the weak plugs for all the other emitters work too. You will, yeah. That's mm -hmm. cool. Or you cut it out and just plug it off. That's not how it works. Yeah, that's that's a very affordable, easy way, it's super efficient way to do it. What I do is I'll I'll put my jerk irrigation in first, I'll snake it through the bed, I'll turn it on. And then wherever the wet spots are, that's where I plug the plants, just like that. That's where I go. So that's how I, that's how I plugged. I had, I don't know how many flats, like six or seven flats of creeping thyme. I ran the irrigation in the area where I wanted that creeping thyme lawn. I buried the line just barely under the, under the soil so I could maintain it down the road. Turned it on wherever I saw a wet spot. That's where I put it in one of those plugs. And it's so you, uh, you, you goof plug where you don't want those coming out. Um, I no, at the very, very end of this. Just at the end. Just the very end. That's all you do. You don't goof plug each one. Uh, you goof plug the very, very end. Yeah, Jerry. Um, you, you can use that around the base of your trees, right? So if you run yeah. spaghetti line off of your main and put a T on it and make a circle around the base of your trees. You could. Um, so this is kind of what you were, you were doing, the gentleman with the fruit trees. Well, well, he's actually, they make an inline emitter. You can actually take the spaghetti tubing putting better where you want it. This is a little bit easier. What you're saying is take this where that emitter was, cut it off, put a T on, and then have this go around the tree and plug in the other end. It just makes a big tree circle, basically. That works very, very well. What I found is, personal experience again, it's better to, instead of a T, just have it go around and don't have it plugged back in. Just plug it back in. Or put, I'd rather keep it loose. In. So that when I need to maintain it, because goop, there's there's sediment, there's stuff in your water, um, and this stuff will plug up. It makes it easier to maintain and find where's the end, where's the stuff going. It always goes to the end of the line. So now I can open it up, flush it. Just just it works both ways. Looks cleaner with it tied into a T, but it's easier to maintain down the road if it's not if you use an elbow instead of a T. Yeah, good question. Jared's actually one of our planters. He actually goes out. He's actually not just a planter. He's actually a plant nerd, hardcore. He's uh, he's run vineyards and all kinds of stuff. Done wine. I'm trying to get him to teach our our uh, grape edible class. How to grow better grape because he's a master. And then Ella's back here. Ella's our other wave. Ella bigger than that. Your whole team is here. Yay! Okay. Yes. I live in the Valley. 
Yes. So I'm sure the products are going to be from Yes. Here, I've got several different applications with the garden, so it'll be flowers and trees. That I use, like, that's only one valve. Oh, so you've, you live in Prescott Valley, you've got one valve yeah, in that box. Be off the so the only way to add another valve in, usually off of this, they call this a manifold, technical terms. If you start using the word to your, your gardener, you're going, hey, I'm going to add to my manifold, he'll be, he'll be impressed. <laughs> uh, usually at the end, it's capped. So you could take this same box. Cut that end off, I, uh, add another valve if you also chose. But I should the valves underneath the house. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So you, you don't know. Okay. I don't so for you to add another valve, you either add it there or you go this off of a hose bib and come off. And that's an easy way to, to you, just, you, you can do this yourself. You can get two yes. There is a splitter, yeah, sure can. Yeah, sure can. But that doesn't make the difference as far as. The water and the two bits. You, you put it on your hose bed. You have one thing on your hose bed, and it's got a, it's, it's got two new bits basically. The oh, water okay. on the oh, I got you. So you track with her. I didn't quite track got it. it. So she's got you covered. It sounds like I love gardeners. <laughs> that, I have more customers helping each other than my staff. It's great. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So the, the so, so she's got a 15 by 16 raised bed garden or vegetable garden with just the way to go. I would use this. I use this for my vegetable garden. This is a great way to go. It's automatically at 12 inch spacings, which is about right for tomatoes, peppers, that kind of stuff. You can either run rows or I prefer to snake it through. I just want to soak the entire area. If you're doing tomatoes, that kind of stuff, things bigger eggplants. Okra, sunflowers, I might space to do it rows. Yeah, again, play with it. It's a great little tool. I think this is 30 or 40 bucks for a 100 foot roll. For one roll will do more than you need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's an efficient way to do it. Yeah. I have different color So she's got different emitters, different colors. How do I tell what color each one is? I don't know. <laughs> no way. What happened was during the downturn, all these, you know, this, that, that downturn was pretty rough. It's been 10 years, but it's pretty rough. And pretty much all of the manufacturers that were are gone. Or they've been bought up and consolidated. And so when they consolidated, all the standards changed. So they went from green. It used to be all the one gallons uh, were red or blue. Or green. Now they're black. I don't know why they're black. They just decided black is one gallon now. Uh, so the only true way to tell, the way we do it is we take a tuna can, some way to measure, we put it underneath the emitter, and we run it for a half an hour or an hour, some way to tell so we can see the met, physically see it, and we look to see how much came out. But just measure it. It's the only true way. But if your plants are happy, good. I'd say go for it. I might as well just replace something. Well, that, okay, replace them. Well, sometimes you need to do that. These parts do get old. If your house is 10 plus years old, they get crusty, the plastic gets brittle, uh, or the emitters just stop working. Again, insects love to lay eggs or bunnies and, and gophers love to nibble on them. And so it's okay to, to upgrade to that. There, I'm, if you're gonna upgrade, use the two gallon per hour button emitter, pressure compensated emitter, okay? On the half inch tubing, yep. how far down in the ground do I bury Good question. That? How far down should the half inch tubing, that bigger distribution line, how far should it be buried? The plumbing code says for your main line, 18 inches. Okay? You do not do that with your drip system. We are not dealing with plumbing code. This is irrigation. I want to be able to find it and get to it easily. So mine is barely under the ground far enough. To keep the soil, to keep the soil, keep it under the ground. Sometimes it magically shows up. I want to be able to get to it, but I'm a gardener. I want to be able to add to my system as I as, as I want another rose or butterfly bush or salvia. I want I want to be able to get to it, add another flower easily. And so I've got five lines in that trench, usually just six inches on the ground. I'm not worried about freezing. 
because the lines will automatically drain because we're on a grade, we're mountain soils, and it's it's under pressure. So at least the pressure is going to release, and usually all the water is going to run out at the bottom of the system. Okay, so I'm not I'm not worried about it freezing. I will every once in a while have to replace an elbow where the water pooled in the winter. Now, that will crack because water sat there, it froze, cracked. But I would rather have that maintenance down the road, having to replace an elbow every once in a while, than to have to go try to figure out where all my lines are 18 inches deep, trying to dig through that is a pain. I want to be able to get to it easy because I'm a gardener. That, that, I, I assume you all are too. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me about hanging baskets? How much do they need to be watered? So hanging baskets, how often do hanging baskets, or just, just go containers, all pots. You need to water it until you see water coming out the bottom, especially hanging basket. So you'll know when that's enough when there's water running out the bottom. You'll know when the big pot has enough water when there's water seeping from the bottom of the pot. That's how you know. If you don't see that, you don't have enough water and that's, that the whole root mass has not been irrigated properly yet. How often? So I've got, I've only got one hanging basket. Well, I've got pots. I have a lot of pots. Anyway, I'm watering every, uh, let me think here, four or five days right now. But it's cool. The nights are very cool. So it's not truly, once we get up to 80, 85 degrees, I'll bump it up probably to every other day for, for my own gardens. Okay? I've got, I try to go bigger. <coughs> bigger is better. Little tiny pots, you're probably watering five times a day. I don't know. It's ridiculous. You can't keep a little thing watered. I go with minimum size this big, my big containers. The more soil you have, the better. Because it's, it's water holding capacity. Let me show you one other product too. I'll probably push this heavy next month as we start to get warm. It's a product we made years ago. It's called Aqua Boost. Every time I plant, I add some of this to the soil. Um, what this is, these are polymer crystals. Uh, those crystals, they, they hold like 200 times their weight in water. If you go to the fair, they'll have those neckerchiefs that like swell up and hold water. That's what this stuff, that's an agricultural product. Here we infuse the crystals with mycorrhizal fungi. So now we've got a product that you put in the soil that holds moisture at the soil. And then it also, uh, it uh, enlivens your beneficial microbes that encourages roots. So, so it holds water that encourages roots, all in one product. So every time I plant a tree, a shrub, whatever, I, I add some of this. But especially my containers. I, I'll add some of this in that top layer, top soil, uh, where it just holds the moisture. It takes the pressure off. It'll cut your water needs in half. Okay? With that, we've gone an hour and a half. Good questions. Excellent.